Good morning, and welcome to the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, in Boulder, Colorado. We are webcasting this to our Gaithersburg, Maryland facility of NIST, and we also have a number of people who are participating in a teleconference online. So welcome, welcome to all those who are participating. We wish you could be here with us in person to celebrate the 2012 Nobel Prize in Physics to Dr. Dave Wineland of NIST and the University of Colorado for outstanding achievement in experimental research on quantum mechanics. Dr. Wineland shares this prize with Serge Hirosh of France, and we're absolutely thrilled to have what is now the fourth Nobel Prize for NIST scientists since 1997. We're going to tell you a little bit about Dave Wineland in just a moment, but I'd also like to tell you just a little bit about NIST and the University of Colorado before we begin, because Dr. Wineland and uh, uh, Dr. Hirosh's uh, Nobel Prize was awarded, and I'm quoting from the Nobel Committee, for groundbreaking experimental methods that enable measuring and manipulation of individual quantum systems. Now, that might sound to some of you like a, a quite confusing thing, but basically it's using the fundamental properties of quantum mechanics, which is nature's instruction book for how atoms and photons behave at the individual level to do really exciting things. And at NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, we are involved in not just doing groundbreaking research, such as that exemplified by Dr. Wineland, but in applying that research for technology and to enable innovation that advances national goals and advances the economy. And the work that Dr. Wineland does, which we'll hear more about in a moment, is directly related to that. Some of the things that he has worked on are related to making better atomic clocks. And atomic clocks are involved in our modern technology infrastructure in all different kinds of ways, from GPS that pretty much everyone has on his or her cell phone nowadays, to telecommunication systems, and a whole host of other things. Dr. Wineland's work is also uh, paving the way for the possibility of quantum computing, making vastly powerful more computers than today's best supercomputers that could tackle problems that we can't even think about solving now in any realistic <laughs> length of time. And many other measurements which are based upon these fundamental properties of quantum mechanics. And Dr. Wineland and his uh, colleague, Dr. Hirosh, are absolute uh, maestros at engineering the states of quantum systems. In Dr. Wineland's case, it's ions, electrically charged atoms, making them do all kinds of tricks and, and unique things to enable advanced measurements, advanced research, and uh, all kinds of other innovations. Uh, Dr. Wineland also has an appointment at the University of Colorado out here in Boulder. NIST and the University of Colorado share a lengthy and very productive relationship. Dr. Wineland has supervised the PhD work of a number of graduate students and postdoctoral fellows. Uh, so in addition to advancing innovation, Dr. Wineland is crucial in training the next generation of scientists and innovators. And we're delighted to have with us uh, a number of folks from the University of Colorado. Dr. Stein Stuhr, who's the Vice Chancellor for Research, um, and uh, Dr. Paul Beal, who's the Chair of the Physics Department. And we're especially delighted to have with us one of NIST's other Nobel laureates, uh, Dr. Eric Cornell, who works at JILA, the joint institute between the University of Colorado and NIST in Boulder, Colorado. Dr. Cornell shared the 2001 Nobel Prize for his work in developing the Bose-Einstein condensator, BEC, an entirely new form of matter that's as different from regular matter as laser light is different from candlelight. And Dr. Cornell is here to share uh, both uh, congratulations with Dr. Wineland and maybe also some wisdom of how one survives that first day after getting the notice of uh, the Nobel Prize. So I think it was about 4 a.m. Uh, local time when uh, Dr. Wineland got the call from Stockholm indicating that he won the Nobel Prize. Uh, we were fortunate to find out among many other people shortly thereafter. And as you can imagine, it's been an absolutely thrilling day because not only has Dr. Wineland pioneered research in quantum mechanics and advanced measurements for for many years now, 37 years at NIST, but he also is a highly valued colleague and a very humble and uh, uh, man who collaborates and cooperates with people across the board. So we're delighted to have, uh, uh, to honor Dr. Wineland for his outstanding research. I'm sure that Dave would be the first one to say that a Nobel Prize, although it's given to an individual, always recognizes a body of work of many, many people. And Dave has mentored and continues to mentor many dozens, I couldn't even count them this morning, of people during his career, and all of them should take pride and share in this Nobel Prize, as should all the folks who are involved in research across NIST and across JIL. What I'd like to do now is we have uh, at our Gaithersburg site, Dr. Patrick Gallagher, who's the director of NIST, 
and also the Undersecretary of Commerce for Standards and Technology. And I think uh, Dr. Gallagher would like to say a few words. Great. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Dave, on behalf of uh, a very proud NIST, uh, I want to uh, extend a very sincere congratulations to you, uh, both from NIST and from the Department of Commerce on this enormous honor. Uh, I know this has been a long day for you already. Uh, I realize it's only half over, um, and it's probably not going to end soon. Um, uh, we were all very excited uh, early this morning uh, catching the news right at 6 a.m., as Tom mentioned. Uh, I know that was two hours earlier for you. Um, but this is really a richly deserved recognition of your work. Um, this is a celebration of the scientific community on the fundamental contributions you've made to understanding uh, how quantum mechanics can be used. Um, it is also a richly deserved celebration of work that's at the forefront not only of science but of our measurement mission here at, at NIST. Um, it's also a celebration of decades of hard experimental work that has really paid rich dividends. And uh, I know from uh, uh, one of the honors I had uh, four years ago was sharing the stage, not the stage, but sharing the event with you when you won the 2007 Medal of Science. Uh, and uh, I know from that ceremony that you're a very modest uh, gentleman, and you're going to share uh, the credit here widely with your uh, many uh, colleagues, students, and collaborators. Uh, but this is your moment to shine, and uh, we are just so proud of you, and so congratulations. Thanks very much, Dr. Gallagher. Let me tell you just a little bit about David Wyman before we uh, turn it over and uh, invite you to ask questions of our uh, most recent Nobel laureate. So David Wyman did his undergraduate degree at the University of California in Berkeley, went on to Harvard and did his PhD in physics with Norman Ramsey. Norman Ramsey shared the 1989 Nobel Prize for developing a crucial science and technology of atomic clocks. As if that weren't enough, Dave Wyman then went on to do a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Washington with Hans Demont who also shared the 1989 Nobel Prize for his development of unique electromagnetic traps, which helped make precision measurement and opened up new fields of interrogating quantum states. And uh, Dave brought that incredible expertise and pedigree here to NIST, then the National Bureau of Standards in 1975, has been on the NIST staff since that time, 37 years now and counting, a very, very productive career. Dave is currently a NIST fellow, which is the highest honor that a NIST scientist can have in the organization, and also leader of the Ion Storage Group. And with that, we'll ask Dave Wyland to please come up and uh, say a few words. And congratulations. To Dave. So, are people going to ask questions, or should I? Go if you could give us a statement first, and then we'll turn over questions. When, when you're ready, whenever you're ready. Well, as I, I told a couple of people already that. Uh, this morning, some, someone pointed me to a web page where I was on the same page as Lady Gaga. <laughs> so I <laughs> to, uh, to they arrived here. Um, no, I, you know, without question, this is a big honor. And, and, and you know, it doesn't happen just with a single person like me. And, you know, a lot of people have been. I've been the pleasure to work with a lot of people over the years. So was, uh, many people share in this, um, in this honor. Um, also, uh, one thing that's been valuable at NIST here is that that, that, that myself and other colleagues we have good support from our uh, managers. Now, my, my boss, Tom O'Brien, but his boss, Catherine Gibby. And Many other people throughout the years, so I think it's uh, it's also a credit to them that, that uh, they provided the environment where we can pursue this kind of work. So, um, as I say, it, um, I'm just one person in this uh, mix, and a lot of people deserve credit for it.
very much, David. Uh, let's take some questions. What we'd like to do is alternate between questions from members of the press who are in the room here in Boulder and then folks who are on the telephone line. So let's start uh, inside here. Any questions or comments for Dr. Wyman? I guess in as plain people terms as possible, can you describe the, the work that got you this prize? Uh, well, okay, so I, I think the, actually I've forgotten exactly how the citation reads, but we're, uh, our group does experiments with single atoms, Tom mentioned in our case uh, charged atoms, and uh, what we've been able to progressively do, we and other groups throughout the world, over the years we've uh, basically been able to control our quantum properties with increasing precision. So uh, Tom mentioned that uh, this has applications in atomic clocks. So we, using these techniques, we've progressively been able to make more and more accurate atomic clocks. Something that's happened in the last 15 years or so uh, is that we've been able to also uh, apply these control techniques to, to start to play games where these quantum properties might be used in a computer, a so-called quantum computer. And I would have to say, uh, at this point, you, I wouldn't recommend anybody buy stock in a quantum computing company. But uh, I, think, I think we're optimistic that uh, in the, as the technology uh, improves over the years, that, uh, that, that this quantum computer really uh, will bring unique uh, capabilities to computing. And I, I think that actually one of the, one of the reasons the, the interest started in, in about 1995 was that uh, a computer theorist, Peter Shore, came up with an algorithm that showed that if you could make this quantum computer, you could efficiently factorize large numbers, meaning uh, if you have a, a, a large number and, and it's the product of two smaller numbers, you can find the those two smaller numbers. And uh, this sounds a little bit esoteric, but in fact, uh, the, the, uh, the security of most and almost all encryption systems that we use is, derives its security from the inability to factorize very large numbers, hundreds of digits. And uh, this quantum computer, if we could make it, uh, could actually solve that kind of problem. Now, in fact, this, this problem, as I say, was a big impetus for, to get the field going, but it's probably the hardest problem people have thought of where a quantum computer might come into play. So I think what most physicists and other scientists feel where the, the, near, the nearer term application uh, for such a device is to solve problems, physical problems, that can be mapped onto this quantum computer uh, but problems that are intractable on, a, on an ordinary classical computer, the, the, the kind of machines we can, when, can have now. And although we haven't really reached the turning point where we've been able to do problems that haven't been simulatable on, on a classical computer, I, I would say I, I think maybe in the next decade or so we'll, we'll cross that threshold where uh, we can do problems that, that are intractable on a classical computer. So this is maybe still a ways out, but uh, I think as scientists we're optimistic about the future in that regard. Do we have a question from our participants on, on the telephone? At this time, if you would like to ask a question, please press star and then one on your touchtone phone. We will be prompted to record your need. Again, if you have a question, please press star one now. One moment, please. <laughs> While we're waiting for them to record their message, is there another question from inside the house here? Did you ever dream of winning this award? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Or even as a as a kid, you know, you, that's this is kind of the biggest thing, and so you think about it. I think you know one thing to say is that there's many other people that could have gotten this work besides me because there's, there's a huge number of people working on this 
very closely related problems. And yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think, you know, you learn that there's a possibility, but as I say, there's so many people that could have gotten this award besides me that you don't want to, you don't want to bank anything on, on anything like that. So I must say this, you know, I had heard of this possibility before in the past, but this year I hadn't honestly heard any rumbling. So I thought, well, maybe, maybe my time has passed. So, <laughs> so it really was, it was a surprise for me. So. Are we ready for a telephone question yet? We do have a question from the phone lines. Uh, we have a question from Bill Lindelof. Your line is open, and please state your affiliation. Hi, this is Bill Lindelof. I'm a reporter with the Sacramento Bee newspaper in Sacramento, California. Um, my question is, uh, from what all I read, you, you grew up here in Sacramento. Is that right? That's right. And uh, did, uh, graduated from Encino High School in 61? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, uh, I'm taking into the Wayback Machine talking about clocks here. Um, did, did your interest in science and math, was it nurtured at Encina? Yeah, I would say so, actually. I, I took a, I, I, I don't think I was the, the best student um, when I was in high school, but um, I must say when I took, uh, there was a physics class I took in my senior year, and I thought, boy, this was pretty cool. So, in fact, uh, I, I started as a mathematics major in college, but, I, but I, 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 not very long after, I switched my major to, to physics. And I, I must say that this high school class in physics really got me interested. And here I am. <laughs> it's a different kind of high school now. It's, it's more uh, ethnically diverse, uh, and the neighborhood's a little different. but. Uh, what, would, what message would you have for the students at uh, Encina today? Well, just find something you like and keep going. And, uh, you know, in my case, I, I guess you know, I was a pretty straight arrow in the sense that I got onto physics pretty early and I still like it. But it doesn't mean that you can't switch your interests and still be successful. But I think it's you know, it's important to have an, have a, take an interest in something and then just go for it. So it takes a lot of hard work, but I, I think that's, you know, that's a, success, a, a way to success. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions <coughs> inside the house now? Yes, please. Can you describe your uh, relationship with the other winner here? And, and in terms of yeah. So yeah. So uh, actually, I've been, I've known Serge Roche for, oh, yeah. I don't know, 25 or 30 years. <coughs> actually, we've become good friends, and are actually, are, you know, we're good. Our, 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 oops, sorry, I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, Another congratulatory call. <laughs> I must say. Uh, yeah, this this phone is only for my wife and I, but then I left it on today since she needed a phone. I use it to tell time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really about oh, two minutes or so. Wait, well, you can you can improve your time clock if you can't shut off the cell phone. <laughs> I'm sorry, I lost the the train there. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So so anyway, so so actually. You know, our wives and our good friends as well. So I've known Serge for a long time, and so it's really a pleasure to be uh, sharing this award with him. Um, actually, our work at first glance maybe it doesn't look quite the same, but actually, it's the the the, the kind of work we've been doing is very closely related. Uh, the, the one difference I might say is that that uh, Serge and his colleagues have used. Uh, atoms to probe the quantum properties of fields uh, and uh, that is electric fields uh, and and we do the opposite thing we use the electric fields from lasers to probe the quantum properties of atoms but, but these but these things are they are very closely related so 
uh, I, I would say when, one nice thing is we haven't been, in some sense we're competitors as well as being friends, but we, it hasn't been a, a direct competition, it's been more complimentary uh, kind of thing we have. So it's, it's been really, it's been fun for that reason. Do we have a question from the phone lines now? I'm showing no further questions from the phone lines. Again, if you do have a question, please press star one and record your name when prompted. Questions from one inside the house. Yes, please. Uh, you mentioned you didn't hear any rumblings about this possibly happening. So could you go through how you were notified and, and um, what was going on this morning when you got that call? Uh, well, let's see, I went, yeah, so um, I actually slept through the, the phone <laughs> ringing and my <laughs> wife got up and then handed me the phone and uh, actually the, 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 you know, the message from the, the Nobel Academy people, they, it was fairly brief and, and then, of course, not, you know, I guess not surprisingly, it was just before apparently it was announced and within five minutes I started getting calls and, uh, and, and I have a lot of calls to answer now. <laughs> we're cut up for for a while here. You know what you're going to do with the money? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, but I will we'll probably figure out something here. <laughs> I mean, it'd be nice to, I, I know that it, you know, we're allowed to take friends, colleagues with us and that'll probably eat up some of the, <laughs> some of the money from transportation fees, things like that. So, uh, but no, I haven't really thought about it. Could you describe uh, in a little detail the, the work you, the teaching you do at CU as well, or what you're doing there? Yeah, actually, I, I mean, I have a uh, what's called the lectureship pos position, but it's uh, um, that's a bit of a misnomer because I I occasionally do lecturing, substituting for when one of the professors is gone. But um, what this what this position mainly allows us to do is to uh, to have graduate students from CU work on our lab. So that's been the, the, uh, uh, the main connection with CU. So we've, we've had graduate graduate students. Students. We have graduate students now. That are... Well, right now we have four in our group, so. Any questions from the phone lines? We have a question from Erin Brown. Please. Your line is open, and please state your affiliation. Hi, this is Erin Brown from the LA Times. Congratulations. Um, I wanted to know what, uh, what what direction your work is going to be taking in in, uh, in the next, uh, you know, in, in the future. I mean, are you continuing to work on the same problems, or or um, has that evolved? Well, I think you know, think, you know, things gradually evolve, and we don't. I think I think it's fair to say we don't have any major changes in mind that uh, hopefully. New things will come out of the work we're doing now, but I, I would say even the the background for the the, the work I've been doing is Tom O'Brien mentioned I came here in 1975, and the, some of the first experiments we did for uh, were using lasers to uh, cool the atoms, uh, cool their thermal motion down, and. Uh, this is part, this is certainly one of the ingredients that we have to rely on for the, for the current work. But what, what I mean to say is this, it's just a sort of a continuous evolution. And uh, I guess my, my mantra would be, uh, I even say this on proposals, is just more and better. We'd like to be able to, to, to work with more, meaning larger quantum systems and, and to be able to control them better. So I don't see this changing in a long time uh, uh, certainly in uh, in my career and I, I don't I, I don't see switching gears I think we'll continue on this path and hopefully get better at what we're doing and what is it that you have to do to get better at it is there a certain problem that you have to crack no I wouldn't there's certainly not any single one but I think it's common in science that uh, we, we were able for the most part to to, to uh, identify what limits us, you know, it, why we can't make do things with higher accuracy, things like that, and mm -hmm. and it, it's pretty simple. They'll they'll be the biggest thing, and we'll try to 
knock that down first and then if we can beat that down there'll be something else that, that that's the biggest problem next and we just keep working that way and I think this is this is fairly common. Okay, thank you. Questions from inside? Yes, please. Can you tell us a little bit about your work with um, atomic clocks and, and you know, precise uh, measuring systems that perhaps um, we see now in, in, in our everyday lives? Or, or can I think, it? yeah, the, the question is, uh, uh, you know, the, the, some of the things we're working on, for example, atomic clocks, can we see applications in, in our everyday lives? And I think a good, uh, as far as atomic clocks go, uh, uh, by the way, I mean, I think, you know, my career, I've always had a hand in the atomic clock work going on here, in addition to this, uh, this business on quantum computing. But over the years, I think a, a good example of how the technology that we that we develop in the lab reaches out to the real world is is for example GPS is a good example so the you know we kind of take for granted the navigational uh, uh, advantages that GPS provides and actually these days the part of the reason for the success of GPS is that the satellites have on board atomic clocks that were first developed in the lab and, and gradually they became the technology was developed enough to be able to make them compact and so on and, and go into satellites. So um, actually when, uh, so this work continues and, and I would say that certainly one of the main applications for centuries of, of clocks, improved clocks is in navigation and that that function still continues uh, and we, we so I think we look, look towards that, that, that these, as we improve clocks, it's, it's certainly been true throughout history that when we've made better clocks, people say, well, why, why do you need to know it? Have them more and more accurate. But whenever a clock has been developed, it's always been picked up and used in the, in the field. So. Those early atomic clocks that are now in, these, in satellites, is that what you work on those? No, they, actually, they, so the question was, uh, with the clocks on satellites, are we working on this now? And, and I think that, the, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the clocks that are on the satellites, they, they, they're derived from, a, from older work in the, in the lab, and, and uh, yet, the, you know, of course, they have to be much more rugged than our, than our clocks in the, in the lab. And uh, so it's a gradual process, and, you know, so these are, the clocks on the satellites don't don't uh, don't utilize the the latest technology, but eventually, as we can improve the technology and, and make it more rugged and robust, it will find its way into the to the field. Satellites, for example. Questions from the phones. Again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star one now. One. Well, while we're waiting, any internal questions here? I'm guessing most people would not realize that you can make the atomic clock better. I, I think most people go, well, that's the best you can get. Um, can you explain, again, in layman's terms, why, why they're wrong? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I think, you know, the sort of the performance of clocks, how, how steady the, the ticking is and, and things like that is, uh, you know, fundamentally, we know as physicists that uh, there's really no limit on how stable they can be, how how how, how uh, continuous and, and stable their clock rate is, uh, and it's it's always a matter of find, you know that there's some typically some environmental effect. For example, uh, well, an example I, I alluded to earlier is that. Uh, uh, some of the earlier atomic clocks, they were based on vibrations and atoms that, uh, but the atoms were moving around inside some container. And so this idea of laser cooling, one of its application was to slow the atoms down. Uh, uh, and, and the reason for that is that uh, when we slow them down, the, uh, 
their frequency shifts due to the Doppler effect. I think, I think most people are familiar with the Doppler effect. The example I was always given, which seems maybe less relevant now, is when a, when a train goes by and the whistle is left on continuously. It's high pitch when it's coming towards you and low pitch when it's going away. And, and this kind of, this change in pitch was a, a problem with atoms in these containers. And it became less of a problem when we could cool them down using lasers. So that's one example of how uh, we just keep beating on these problems that limit the performance. And, uh, and, and they, the problems never go away, but our, hopefully our ability to, 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 to suppress them you know, continues. And that's, that's the way it's been, for sure. So we look for that continued improvement. Questions from the phones? I'm showing no questions from the phone lines at this time. OK. Any last questions from inside? Yes, please. Oh, can you just talk a little bit about what the Nobel Prize means to you in, in, in terms of like a crowning achievement versus something that pushes you forward to accomplish even more in your career? Well, I, I, you know, it's obviously you know, a great honor. And I think that, um, you know, I, I mean, I don't have any plans of changing my course of action until they drag me out of here for being too old. But <laughs> I think, uh, but I think, you know, the thing to say is that, the, you know, the real reward is the science itself and being able to work with, the, you know, our colleagues. And, you know, that's what keeps us going, not the, not the awards we can sometimes get along the way. Like you've uh, rubbed elbows and have been mentored by other Nobel winners. What, uh, what do you hope for the people that are studying under you and have assisted you through the years? Well, I, I wish them. <laughs> oh, the, the, I think the question was, uh, I had, you know, I had, well, I did my graduate work and then my postdoctoral work with both with Nobel Prize winners and. You know what? What about the students and postdocs, my colleagues that work with me? And I don't think I have any great words of wisdom, except I think they they realize that you know the opportunity is there, and and, and I think many of them take 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 uh, that opportunity and, and push themselves to go farther. And uh, many have already gone on to ex establish their own successful groups and. Even when it, with our, our group, the senior colleagues that I've worked with for over 30 years, they have their own projects and, and have been very successful. So I don't know whether I had much to do with that, but I think it's more the, the group aspect that, that, that enabled that. So. Any last questions? Have you gotten any advice from, from previous winners or your colleagues? Uh, well, I just talking to. Yeah, the, the question was, have I gotten any advice from previous winners? And uh, I, Eric Cornell, who's here, uh, who won the, shared the Nobel Prize a few years ago, he's, he's offered me some help. So I'm sure there's some tips that I could uh, learn before, <laughs> before embarking on the, going to Sweden and <laughs> the big ceremony. So. And the ceremony will be December 10th in Stockholm. We're all looking forward to that. I think at this point, uh, Dave has been absolutely overwhelmed. He continues to be with lots of questions and comments. So I think we'll draw this to the close. Unless any last comments from the phones or anything from Gaithersburg. We will have at Miss Boulder a reception right out in the lobby. I hope you will join Dave Wineland and the rest of us, all the folks in this room and in the auditorium, for a uh, brief reception to recognize and honor Dave before we Give him a break and let him let him try to start recover from this wonderful, marvelous, happy chaos that we're having out here. And thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And congratulations, Dave Wineland. <laughs>